So joining me now to talk more about this is Greg Rinke. He is an attorney and a former military man himself. Thank you very much for being with me. I, I appreciate it. Um, you uh, just give us your background briefly. You actually have uh, considerable expertise in this area. Yeah, I was in Army uh, JAG for six years, served as a prosecutor, defense counsel, and then appellate defense counsel uh, in the Army JAG Corps. So have you ever seen a situation like this, though? Have, has the country been faced with a situation like this before? Well, we've never been faced with a situation exactly like this. I mean, we've handled AWOL soldiers and deserters numerous times before, but what makes this interesting is when we take into account the possibility of you know, POW and potentially of being a des deserter. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a unique set, set of facts. Now, right, tell us, if you will, what the difference is between mm -hmm. AWOL and desertion. AWOL is, is basically absent without leave. Desertion is when you leave your unit with the intent to permanently remain away. So in order to be considered a deserter, you need to have formulated the intent to never return to your unit, to permanently desert. And is that difficult to prove? Well, it depends on the situation. I mean, you have to look at the surrounding circumstances of the case um, at the time that the soldier left the unit. So um, it really just depends on the type of situation. I mean, in the United States, if someone leaves their, their unit and then doesn't come back and then is picked up or apprehended by law enforcement, we can pretty much say that they had the intent never to come back. Right, but when you talk about this situation mm -hmm. where there, there's somebody thousands of miles away in another country in a remote area where it appears like there wasn't anything set up for him, for anybody waiting for him to assist him, right. um, that it seems, and obviously we're presuming a lot here, that he probably didn't intend to depart and never come back. I, I think that's exactly uh, true. Is Government prosecution in this type of matter, if they elected to prosecute Soren Bergdahl, it, it would be very difficult to say that he formed the intent to permanently uh, depart his unit and never come back. Well, but his Facebook posts, uh, I imagine, and his correspondence with friends, specifically one woman in particular who's been quoted, would probably be the best evidence that they had. And also some mm. his discussions with his um, colleagues, obviously, his uh, the form, the other members of the platoon, but also the idea that he walked away before, how significant would that be? I think it's significant to show that if he had left the unit before and then come back, well, I mean, he's going to argue and say that, well, I had left before and come back. So it might not have been the intent to permanently depart the unit and not come back or to desert the unit. What's the difference in terms of prosecution? I mean, um, absent without leave, obviously you're penalized for mm -hmm. that, you're reprimanded, but um, it's a whole different story when you talk about desertion. Right. Absent without leave is a m relatively minor military offense, uh, punishable by, I mean, it's still a court martialable offense, but desertion, especially desertion in time of war, uh, is punishable by the military by ultimately the death penalty. Um, do I think that's going to happen in this case? Absolutely not. But it is a very significant, uh, serious uh, crime, desertion. You mentioned the investigation. I mean, we're talking about something that is just getting underway. Mm -hmm. A person who's just been returned, actually, mm -hmm. and, and had not yet been even reunited with his family. And we don't know the extent to which he has been questioned, although it seems like he has at least to some degree been questioned about the details. Um, but his mental state is in question. How long of an investigation would this be? Well, I think some of it has already been investigated. It's my understanding that there was a 15-6 military investigation that was done when he left. So some of that investigation has already been done. Uh, in order for them to start questioning him now, if he's suspected of a crime, which potentially he really is, he has to be read his Article 31 rights, which are similar to Miranda rights in the civilian world, where he has the right to invoke, not to make a statement, has a right to an attorney. So I'm not sure if he has actually been questioned yet. And if he has a right to an attorney, would that be an attorney that's assigned to him, or does he have the right to hire outside counsel? He has the right to both. He has the right to assign military defense counsel, and he also has the right to hire civilian counsel at no expense to the government. To work together? Yes, they will work together. Ultimately, the civilian counsel makes that call if he wants to keep the, the assigned military attorney on the case or dismiss him. So you have some ideas about this already. I mean, obviously, you, you know pretty much as much as we do. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume, um, so we should just put this out there, no inside knowledge right. before we start opining. But y you don't actually believe that ultimately he's going to be prosecuted? I, I don't believe he's going to face a court-martial. I believe that there's going to be an investigation and he might face some administrative actions, whether it be an Article 15, non-judicial punishment, or be administratively separated from the military. Um, whether it be a medical separation, a medical disability retirement, 
I think that there's a lot of mental health issues that are definitely going to come into play here. At the time that he departed, and also we don't know what his mental health status is right now. Right. Well, at the time that he departed, again, his writings probably will be critical in this area and interviews with people who had been with him. I mean, there's a, a lot of anger, it seems, not only among members of Congress who have been saying a lot of things, but mm -hmm. also uh, among members of the unit, it, it sounds like to me. And is that admissible? All of that information is admissible? You do, do, does a prosecutor and the defense take into consideration how people might have felt about this guy? Well, I mean, some of that's going to be hearsay, and, and defense would object to allowing how people felt about having to search for him while he was missing. But I, I think legitimately their arguments and their feelings are legitimate. I mean, if he walked off the unit and they had to go find him and they were taking casualties, I could clearly understand how they would feel that, you know, some anger towards this soldier. What about the responsibility, if any, that he bears for the casualties that were sustained in looking for him? I don't think the government's going to charge him with that. Uh, I mean, it's always a possibility, but I think it would be a stretch for the government to charge him with those casualties. Why? Well, because I, I think you're not able to really draw the direct correlation between his potential disappearance and the Americans taking those casualties. Americans fall under the, uh, we, we don't leave a comrade behind. And at this point, he hasn't been charged with anything. He's still an American soldier, so they had to do their duty to go out and to search for him. When you talk about the various different types of separation mm -hmm. that, there, uh, that there are, what does that mean in terms of his benefits? Well, if he's administratively separated with an honorable discharge, he gets all of his benefits. If he's medically discharged with a medical disability retirement, potentially he'll get retired pay um, for the rest of his life. Uh, if he's somehow separated from misconduct, he could get an other than honorable discharge, which would take some of his benefits away. Uh, if he's court-martialed, he could face a bad conduct discharge or a dishonorable discharge, which he would have substantial prejudice in civilian life. Will they take into consideration when this entire investigation and the decision comes up to be whether or not he faces charges that the man spent five years in captivity? I mean, that, that's got to come into play, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. As a defense counsel, that would be one of the first things that I would be raising here is, is no matter what happened five years ago, he was held captive as POW for five years. What is his mental state? What has he went through? I think it's already come out that he said he's been tortured over that period of time, kept in a cage. That's definitely going to come out as mitigation. And regardless of what the military decides, can then there be any civilian liability? No. He's, he's subject now to the Uniform Code of Military Justice because he's a military member. There would be no civilian, civil liability. And what do you think the timeline is here? I mean, how many years are we going to be dealing with this? I don't think we're talking years. I think we're talking months. Uh, a lot of it's going to depend on his mental, his mental status. Uh, I, mean, I think that's the first thing that we need to make sure of is that he's mentally okay, he's physically okay, and then the investigation will continue. But I think we're talking months. Well, one thing that we do know is that his life has changed forever regardless Absolutely. of what happens here. And certainly it's been a significant discussion and will continue to be. Greg Rinke, I thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.